Hi, and welcome to the Canadian Privacy Lawyer Channel. One of the questions I get most often, and actually one of the most read uh, posts on my Canadian Privacy Law blog, relates to whether or not individuals and citizens can record the police when they're in public places. And this, of course, is a question that has become even more acute in the last couple of years uh, compared to when it first addressed it a number of years ago. Just a little bit of a, a disclaimer. So this channel and its content are provided for general information only. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is a general overview, and it's designed to be educational and hopefully informative. Uh, but this is a complicated area of the law, and one that's rapidly changing, or at least regularly changing, or has a whole bunch of nuances. So if you have any specific legal questions, or if you, you need to know exactly how the law applies to any particular situation, you should seek qualified legal advice. And also, all these opinions are my own. It should not be attributed to anybody else, including my firm or its clients. And I should also note that this is about Canadian privacy law. And so what I'm going to talk about only applies in Canada. So what are the principles at play? Well, in fact, uh, we're probably used to thinking about privacy regulation being all over the place in Canada. Uh, but, you know, the way that privacy regulation works is that governments are regulated in what information they can collect, use, or disclose about individuals. Businesses are broadly regulated. But there's a significant gap, which is probably a, a, a feature, not a bug, uh, that private citizens collecting personal information for their own use are not subject to any of these general privacy statutes. So we have the federal privacy law, PIPEDA, applies to commercial activity. Essentially, that's the same in Alberta, British Columbia, and Quebec. So those private sector statutes don't regulate what individual citizens can do with respect to collecting personal information for their own purposes. And some of the statutes actually have an express carve-out that says, hey, this law specifically does not apply to an individual who collects personal information for their own personal or what's called domestic purposes. But at the same time, we also have privacy torts. So that's where an individual can sue somebody else for invasion of privacy. And so what those always require is that there be an unreasonable invasion of privacy or an intrusion into seclusion, which is how one of these are, torts are characterized, or the public dissemination of private facts. But the reality is that people in public places or people in places that are generally accessible to the public or people in places that are within public view have a reduced expectation of privacy. Now, there still can be some expectation of privacy. It doesn't disappear entirely, necessarily, but it's significantly reduced in a public place. And then add on top of that, the public servants working in the course of their employment, they would have a further reduced expectation of privacy. And they also have a greater expectation of accountability to the public. And I think this is particularly the case with police officers where police officers are given extraordinary powers, are given guns, and are sent out into the streets. And the way that they are accountable is through some legal mechanisms and police discipline and things like that. But there's also a critical component, which is accountability to the public. Uh, and if, they, if their actions do not withstand public scrutiny, that's an important thing to know and to understand, and that should be disseminated. But also, behind all of this, is that you cannot interfere with or obstruct the lawful actions of a peace officer. So if a police officer is carrying out their lawful duty, and it has to be a lawful duty, and you interfere with that or you obstruct that, you could be charged with and guilty of obstruction. But in most cases, somebody standing on the sidelines uh, with a camera, with a camera phone, not in the way, uh, it would not be obstructing, and they would have a lawful right to record a police officer doing whatever they're doing in public. And frankly, they can also record images of the person that they're interacting with or arresting, uh, and crowds and anybody else in that, uh, in that public place. So what are some additional principles at play? Well, we also have in the background the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And that is uh, a, a, it's part of the Constitution of Canada. It's the absolute law of Canada. So any law uh, or any official government action that is inconsistent with the Charter is null and void of no force and effect. And within the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, we have Section 2B, which guarantees the right of freedom of expression. Now, freedom of expression also includes the right to collect information. You know, frankly, it would be a pretty hollow right if all you could do was say things, but you weren't able to do the things that are uh, antecedent to that, to collecting information. 
and that's been held for reporters, but that same right applies to everybody, every person who is resident in Canada uh, has the right, has the protection of Section 2B, which is to, to collect information and to disseminate information. Now, bear in mind also your camera or your phone is not a shield. All the rights under Section, under the Charter, <laughs> are subject to reasonable limitations prescribed by law that can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So if you're doing something illegal and you're just holding up a phone, that is not a shield. That is not going to protect you. And I'm going to talk about some cases that, uh, that have addressed this, where the courts have had some pretty strong things to say about the ability of individuals to photograph or record police, uh, particularly in public places. So the first case I'm going to talk about is Her Majesty and Xerophonitis, which is a 2013 decision of the Ontario Court of Justice. Uh, I'll include a link to the full decision below in the, uh, in the description. Uh, and in that case, an Ontario Court of Justice uh, hearing was held in order to determine the appropriate sentencing for a police officer who had pled guilty of assault causing bodily harm. So this was a police officer who assaulted another person uh, and uh, had pled guilty to it and the question was what would be the appropriate sentence. And in this case the defendant police officer was an officer who attended at a bar uh, in response to several noise complaints and there have been recurring noise complaints at this particular bar. And at that time, there happened to be a professional photographer in the bar who had been hired to take pictures of a rap competition. And so, of course, the police officer comes in and you have a professional photographer with a camera. The camera turns around and he starts taking photographs of the police interacting with individuals in the bar. And when the police ejected people from the bar, the photographer followed along uh, and continued to take photographs out in the street of the interactions between the police and uh, others with whom those police officers were interacting. Now, at that point, the cop ordered the photographer to stop taking photos and then told the photographer to leave the area. Now, when the photographer refused, uh, the police officer arrested the photographer for public intoxication, a regulatory offense under Ontario's liquor control regulations. And in the course of arresting the photographer, the cop punched the photographer while subduing him, uh, breaking bones in his face. So a significant assault or a significant uh, use of, uh, of force uh, in making that arrest. And so the officer was charged with assault, causing bodily harm, uh, which was deemed to be excessive. The, the, the force used was excessive, uh, and it was also admitted to be excessive. So the question was what sentence was going to be appropriate. And so in determining the appropriateness of the sentence, the court went through kind of what happened uh, and, and what were the different interests that were at play. And so this is from the decision, starting at paragraph 24. The court says, in the course of the submissions, I asked Mr. McKay, that would be the lawyer for the police officer, whether or not the direction to stop photographing was a lawful direction. I eventually got an answer that I take to be the only sound answer to that question. Unless Mr. Farakas, that's the photographer, unless Mr. Farakas' presence or actions were creating a danger to him or to others, ordering him to stop photographing was not a lawful command on Mr. Xerophonitis' part. And the court then says, this is not a trivial matter. The court then goes on to talk about uh, the interaction between the police and the public, and particularly the right of the public to take photographs in circumstances like this. And the court notes, and this is applicable across the board, police-citizen interaction typically involves a significant power imbalance. Now, when it comes to photographers, the court says, in the absence of an overarching and tangible safety concern, such as telling a photographer at a fire scene to back away if there's a danger that the building will collapse on him, the court emphasizes telling people not to record these interactions, whether they be a bystander or the person the police is dealing with. So if you are being questioned, this is an aside, if you are being questioned by a police officer, you would have the right to record that. The court then goes, it's not a lawful exercise of police power. An officer who conducts himself reasonably has nothing to fear from an audio, video, or photographic record of his interaction with the public. And just an aside again here, I've had conversations with police officers who have said to me that, frankly, their actions in public, and frankly in private, uh, should withstand public scrutiny, and should withstand scrutiny of a record being made of, of what their actions are. 
Uh, and so don't object to any recordings being made. So the court then goes on and says, the public has a right to use means at their disposal to record their interactions with the police, something that many police services themselves do through in-car cameras and similar technology. The officer's powers exist to allow him to protect the public and himself and to enforce the law, and they do not extend to controlling the public record of what happened. The maintenance of that public record plays a significant role in the maintenance of the rule of law, the existence of this form of objective oversight has great potential to minimize abuses of authority and to maintain peaceable interaction between police and the citizenry, all of which is very much in the public interest. Interference by a, public off by a police officer in the public's exercise of that right is a significant abuse of authority. So in this case, the court is clearly saying that taking records of police actions is in fact beneficial and any interference by the police in the public's right to do that is a significant abuse of authority. So a, a, a very uh, important statement by the Ontario court in that case in favor of the public right to record interactions with the police. So here's another case. This is one from 2006, so from a while ago, and it's a New Brunswick Provincial Court decision. Uh, and I've used this, this course or this case as an example in my internet and media law case for, for some time. Uh, and it's amusing in its antiquity in some sense. So in this case, you had an accused who was arrested and charged and actually taken to trial on obstruction of justice, obstruction of a peace officer. And the accused was at a convention center and he was reporting for his blog on an expected protest uh, that ultimately turned into a bit of a riot. And so the accused, the blogger, was in a public foyer taking photos and talking to participants uh, on both sides of the line before what the court characterized as all hell breaking loose. So the accused was arrest, arrested as part of the melee and his camera was left on the floor by the arresting officer. Another officer picked it up, took it to the station, and when that officer got to the station, turned on the, turned on the camera, started looking through the photographs, saw a photograph of himself and then deleted that picture in particular, but perhaps other, other uh, photos on the camera. The accused said the entire memory card had been wiped. So the blogger had been arrested and was charged with obstruction. Uh, and it's a very important case, and it's, it says some important things, but there's some hilarious passages and, and interesting in the way that, uh, that the, the judge uh, characterized the whole situation and the scenario. And so the paragraphs aren't numbered, but this is from the beginning, beginning of the decision. So in this case, the court says, police work is difficult on the best of days. June 9th, 2006 was not a good day. To say that all hell broke loose for a few terrifying moments at the Trade and Convention Center on that day would not do justice to the situation. No amount of training could have prepared three of St. John's finest standing at the entrance to the meeting rooms of the center for the onslaught of massed and noisy demonstrators racing towards them with sticks and signs, intent on pushing their way through the glass doors to the interior of the conference hall. Only the strength and courage of these three officers who stood up to the onslaught prevented a more serious situation from developing inside the meeting room. These officers are to be commended for their courage and determination. Although slightly later in the judgment, their testimony is not believed. So then the court talks about the defendant. So caught up in the middle of this was the defendant, Charles LeBlanc. There's no evidence whatsoever that he was in any way involved with the group of protesters. Mr. LeBlanc is a blogger. I'm sure that many, if not the majority of St. Johners are not familiar with this word. It is not surprising since the word, to my knowledge, has not yet found its way into a dictionary. So I went to the computer in an attempt to find a definition. The Google website defines blogger as a person who writes weblogs and blog as a shortened version of that weblog. So in technology law, it's often amusing to kind of go back to see how courts grappled with uh, technology and uh, means of communication that were new at that particular time. So the court then goes on and, and ha after having discovered what a blogger is um, and having successfully used Google, uh, goes on and talks about what actually happened. And so as I said, uh, Mr. LeBlanc was arrested and his camera was on the ground. And the court says, Mr. LeBlanc's camera was picked up by Sergeant Parks, who held onto it and transported it to the police station where Mr. LeBlanc was being held. 
Sergeant Parks took it upon himself to turn the camera on, and upon seeing a picture of himself on the camera, deleted it. He testified that he was very uncomfortable seeing his picture on Mr. LeBlanc's camera, and that's why he deleted it. On cross-examination, it was suggested that Sergeant Parks had deleted all the pictures on the camera, but he denied it. Suffice to say, from a personal standpoint, I can understand Sergeant Parks' actions in deleting the picture. But from a legal standpoint, however, it is unacceptable. The camera was never seized as evidence. It was just found at the scene and it was taken in. It was not processed as evidence. Legal access to the contents of the camera would be permitted only through a search warrant. So even if it had been taken as evidence, uh, they would not have been able to turn it on and go through the photographs without a warrant authorizing the search of that particular camera. The court notes no warrant was ever obtained by Sergeant Parks, so he had no legal right to erase a picture from Mr. LeBlanc's camera. In fact, he had no legal right to even look into the camera. Uh, that was an unlawful act on the part of Sergeant Parks. The court then goes through uh, case law related to obstruction of police officers, including a case referred to as Knowlton. And the court says, look, unlike the Knowlton case, there was clearly no marked area where the public was not permitted at the time of Mr. LeBlanc's arrest. So Mr. LeBlanc wasn't in a prohibited area. Barricades that had been in place earlier in the day had been destroyed by the protesters. And there's no suggestion that Mr. LeBlanc was involved in this. And for all intents and purposes, Mr. LeBlanc was ostensibly in an area that was accessible to all. And in fact, open to the public when he was taking his photographs. And the court notes members of the mainstream media were there. Uh, the defendant was talking to other people on both sides. Um, and so he was simply doing what he was doing as a blogger. But what a blogger was doing is unknown to the uh, police service of, of St. John, New Brunswick, it appears. The court says he was simply plying his trade, gathering photographs and information for his blog, along with other reporters. Why Sergeant Park singled him out, I can only speculate. It's clear from the CBC video that contrary to what Sergeant Parks testified to, Mr. LeBlanc was off to his right some distance and not behind him. It's likewise clear when reviewing the tape in slow motion that contrary to what Sergeant Parks testified to, the defendant was not moving towards him just prior to his arrest. It is inconceivable to me, after viewing the tape, how Sergeant Parks could have perceived the defendant down on one knee some distance from the protesters taking pictures as a threat. Other people were in the immediate area of the defendant, some taking pictures, and at least one of whom was a marked protester who was not even approached by the police. So on the facts, he wasn't obstructing anything that was going on. Uh, and so the charge of obstruction was, was not made out. The court then talks about kind of what Mr. LeBlanc was actually doing there. It may well be asked if Mr. LeBlanc's chosen occupation as a blogger had any bearing on my decision in this case. And the answer to that is yes and no. The fact that the defendant was a blogger explained why he was at the Trading Convention Center taking pictures while the riot was going on. It could also explain why he was on a first name basis with some of the delegates. It would also explain why he was so upset at being arrested as he obviously considered himself to be a legitimate member of the media who had done nothing wrong. The court then says, assuming for the purpose of my decision that Mr. LeBlanc was a legitimate member of the media, did this grant him any special exemption from following the directions of the police? And the answer to that is clearly no. Provided the police are acting in the execution of their duties and not exceeding their common law powers, Mr. LeBlanc and any other member of a so-called mainstream media or mainstream news organization would be obligated to follow the instructions of a police officer. Again, provided the officer was acting within the scope of his authority. Members of the media are no different than any other citizen in this regard. A legitimate order from a police officer must be followed by every citizen. If I were satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that Sergeant Parks was acting within his authority and had not exceeded his common law powers, then if he ordered the defendant to leave the Trade and Convention Center, the result in this case would have been very different. And so the court goes through, and I'm not going to read all of this, but I, I would recommend you read the decision as it's interesting, uh, and I will have a link to it in the, uh, in the um, video description below. Um, so the court is not satisfied beyond any reasonable doubt that Mr. LeBlanc had, in fact, interfered with or obstructed. 
one of the big takeaways is that you know the, the police do have a common law authority to issue orders, and those orders will need to be followed. So, for example, if there was a public safety reason to clear the plaza at the convention center, the police could lawfully issue that order, and anybody who refused to could be found to be obstructing, uh, or could perhaps be subject to some to some other offense. But in this case, there wasn't an order, a lawful order that was made that Mr. LeBlanc had, had disobeyed. <clears throat> the court does say, look, kind of having come to this conclusion that there, that there was no obstruction, uh, it's not necessary for me to consider the stay of proceedings order requested by the defense in its pretrial document on the basis of charter rights violations. <clears throat> so the court does a, a little bit of consideration of the charter rights that are, that are at issues related to his charter right to collect information as a blogger but that would also be applicable as a private citizen. But the court says, look, the issues of arbitrary arrest and unwarranted destruction of evidence on the defendant's camera would have weighed heavily in favor of a stay of proceedings if he'd had to go there. And then the, then the court, uh, in its interesting manner that's kind of characteristic of this decision, <clears throat> uh, having found Sergeant Parks to not be credible and having found that Sergeant Parks had exceeded his lawful authority in searching the camera, and had significantly exceeded his lawful authority uh, by destroying evidence uh, and photographs taken by Mr. LeBlanc, the court tries to make it up in the conclusion in which he say, says, the court says, it is very easy in the cool, clear light of day for this court to calmly and coolly analyze and make decisions about the actions of police officers who are making split second decisions in the heat of the moment. But this is what, what the court is obliged to do. In spite of my feelings in this case, there is one conclusion I have come to beyond any doubt. These courageous officers acted above and beyond the call of duty in preventing a serious breach of the peace. If these young masked invaders had succeeded in gaining access to the main meeting room where probably hundreds of delegates were in, in attendance, God knows what would have happened. So the cops did manage to prevent a significant uh, breach of the peace. Uh, but at the same time likely violated the charter rights of a blogger um, and were unjustified in their arrest of him. So at the end of the day, uh, let's just kind of come up with some important points. And again, this is relatively high level. So there's no law in Canada that prevents a member of the public from taking photographs or video in a public place. There are some limitations related to sensitive defense installations, but you know, those aren't that common. If you're out in the street, uh, there's no prohibition. There's no law in Canada that prevents a member of the public from taking photographs or video of a police officer executing his or her duties in public or in a location lawfully controlled by the photographer. <clears throat> and you know, as, the, as the courts have said, you know, frankly, the person interacting with the police has the right to record that interaction. Uh, so it's not just bystanders who are well out of the way who have the right to take out their camera, take out their phone, and record the interaction. Preventing a person from taking photos or video is a prima facie infringement of that person's charter rights. Now that's if the person doing the preventing is a public actor. So are they a police officer or other public officer? Because the actions of public officers are those that are subject to charter scrutiny. Uh, if you're in a shopping mall and you take out your camera and the manager there, security there, tell you to take out, to put your camera away, that doesn't engage your charter right uh, because that's a private actor. But you should know that people who own private property or people who manage private property can put conditions on entry into that property, which can include uh, no photographs. Now, you cannot interfere with a police officer's lawful execution of his or her duties. But being on the sidelines, taking photos or videos does not, in and of itself, constitute interference or obstruction. Uh, and so if you are commanded to stop taking photos, that is an unlawful command that you do not have to follow. All of these rights and privileges are not just reserved to the media. Everyone has these rights. And it's also important to know that a police officer cannot make you unlock your phone to show him or her your images. Uh, and the police officer cannot make you delete any photos. Now, if your, if your camera does contain evidence of a crime, or your phone does contain evidence of a crime, it can be seized. Now, the police cannot further search it without a warrant unless, and you know, to highlight the complexity of this area, there are exceptions to most rules. Uh, the police can, for example, search your device, incident to your arrest if it's necessary to do so. 
We need to also think about, you know, in some cases, the public may have an expectation of privacy in public places. Um, there have been some uh, cases, all the way up to the Supreme Court, related to voyeurism, which hinges on expectation of privacy, which is taken in a public place. You need to be aware that the owner or manager of private property can put conditions on entry into the property, such as no photography or no videos. Uh, now, violating that isn't an offense per se, it's trespass, it's usually civil trespass, um, and notice has to be given. They can't just come up to you and say, hey, no, no photographs. Uh, you have to have had notice about that, that that is one of the conditions of your entry into the property. And as, as I alluded to, a search of a camera phone can be lawful in some circumstances, uh, principally where it's incident to arrest, and it can be justified as being proportional in those particular circumstances. So I hope you found this to be uh, interesting and educational and informative. Again, it shouldn't be taken as, as legal advice, but it, these two cases that I highlighted in particular, I think, uh, raise the legal issues related to photographing the police uh, in public places, uh, talk about the constitutional rights that individuals have, uh, and make it abundantly clear that the police do not have any right to prevent somebody from photographing them in a public place unless you're doing so in a manner that actually interferes with or obstructs uh, their investigation and their lawful duties. One thing that's also worth noting, if you're standing too close and you could potentially be uh, interfering, uh, they need to give you a warning and tell you to get back. And if you move out of their way pretty quickly, uh, that sort of trifling uh, interference with them, if it's just trifling and passing and you've remedied it quickly, uh, should not be the basis for an obstruction charge. So th thank you very much, and hopefully we'll uh, have more uh, videos of interest related to Canadian privacy law. If you have any comments on this video, uh, please leave them in the comments below. And if you have any suggestions uh, for further topics that you think would be of broad interest, uh, please include those in the comments below. Thanks so much.